Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. to the channel I'm Hank Strange today we're actually in Sioux Falls South Dakota we're at the Silencer Central headquarters and we're gonna get an inside look at Silencer Central and show you guys how they're changing the whole suppressor game let's do it I love these wraps these are awesome there's the cans, I guess, going from 22 down to, I don't know, what is this? Is it a 50? I don't know. And we have some special guests today from media content creators, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks. Hey guys, I'm Hank Strange. I'm a YouTuber, and I'm from Gainesville, Florida. Thanks to you guys for coming out. I know you'll be on the range later today. It's exciting stuff. If you see them around, say hi, talk to them. They have really interesting ideas, and their content's amazing. So, thank you guys. All right, there you go. So these guys just wrapped up what they call their scrum meeting. So they talk about everything that happened the day before, catch up. They introduced us and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool, you know, I like that. You get together in the morning, talk about what happened the day before, what you accomplished and what's coming up. So very cool. And that's the kickoff to the day here at Silencer Central. Let's keep going. So, think of um, me moving to South Dakota and um, started shooting prairie dogs in the western part of South Dakota. And they just, uh, as soon as you shoot them, they disappear. So the thought was, how do we fix this? And that's kind of where I got the idea of the silencer. But the key point is, it started out really as um, me getting um, an FFL and an SOT really just for myself. And the goal was to really just benefit myself. And the license is fairly expensive, so the wife starts leaning on me a little bit like, okay, this is great that you've got your federal firearms license and your SOT that you can do silencers for yourself, but how are we gonna pay for this? So that's when I started to start selling them. So I started the corporation, believe it or not, in Florida in 2005. And then when I moved here, I brought it with me, so I didn't have it for very long. Okay. Um, but I would say my first FFL, like applied, got it, approved, maybe like 2006, seven. Yeah. So um, then I decided to do events. So really it was like the gun show thing. It just, I just had used ones. I mean, I had I was I was a student enough to come up with like brochures and business cards, which no one else had it. What year show. was this? Like 2007, probably, mm -hmm. okay. you know. Um, and so, um, gosh, the gun, show, the gun shows were just great. I mean, it started with, I was your stereotypical pharmacist behind the counter and honestly mm -hmm. didn't interact much. And there was a ton of interest, but there wasn't a whole lot of sales. So then I got in front of the table and I would hand it to you and put my hand in my pocket and you would try to hand it back to me and I wouldn't take it. <laughs> and I would just say, okay, you've been thinking about getting one, obviously, you know, what would you use it for? <laughs> I mean, do you see the benefits for hunting and it's gonna reduce recoil and it's gonna make your bullets tighter, tighter groups. I mean, like all the, and then I would use the, almost 100% of them cow would hunt in the Dakotas. So I would say, you know, if you call Calling three coyotes, how many of the three do you want to shoot? And the answer is four. So, I mean, you know, it's like if I don't scare them off, I, you know. So, um, no, it went really well and just evolved. So, this setup right here is basically analogous to what we do at events. This is, it evolved over time. Because remember, the sales pitch at the event is that we can do all your paperwork like super quick. Um, that's sort of the hook that gets people interested. So, this has evolved where I told you we have a variance to do fingerprints, photos, trust, everything digitally. Um, we can do it all right here, so that's why if someone walks in, we're able to do it here. Um, this yeah, area right here is all sales. Probably, this is right mostly there. our salespeople. Here's where we have locations. So here's all the 42 states where um, we have locations. Where the bullseye is is not necessarily where the location is. It just means you can hunt with them there. The only state where you can have a silencer that you can't hunt with them is Connecticut. I usually make the joke who would want to hunt there anyway, and no one ever complains. No one ever gives me pushback. It happens. The average price is about four or five months. So if you go outside, is that the only state you can hunt with? The other you can hunt with. 
Yeah, Connecticut's the only state you can't. Every other state you can't. You cannot hunt with yeah. a suppressor. Yeah, Connecticut's okay. the only state you can't. Uh, Connecticut's the only state you can't hunt with silencer. Right. Everywhere else where they're legal. Yeah. Which was kind of a big deal. Like, honestly, most states were silent on it. Like, even South Dakota was. North Dakota was. I think North Dakota proactively created a bill and said you can hunt with them here, which we didn't really need because but it never said you couldn't. Um, so I always like to bring people in this room because I think it's an interesting story. So you probably heard this morning that so far this year we've given like $1.2 million to conservation. We're on track this year to get $5 million to conservation, which is a big number that we don't really probably do enough talking about. But... Just to give you some history there, so um, probably the first one we started working with was the National Wild Turkey Foundation, and here's kind of how this evolved. So once I got more licenses in states, then I went to the National Wild Turkey Federation and said, hey, we'd like to work your um, annual convention in Nashville. And they're like, kind of like the gun shows, what I told you before, they're like, uh, good to hear from you, Mr. Who is this again? Uh, we have a five-year waiting list. We'll, uh, we'll get back in touch with you if we're interested. You know, thanks for the call. And I'm like, okay, time out. I said, most people that buy from me who ask me to donate a, a silencer to their local chapter for a fundraiser, I always say yes. So I was like, I, with, you guys have someone who's very active in Sturges that manages South Dakota and North Dakota. And I said, I think I've given him a lot of silencers. So I called him up. We got a list of all the silencers we've given him. And what we do is we give a silencer away and they get 100% of whatever's raised at that event. Mm -hmm. So what they found was like over three or four years, we'd given $100,000 to the National Wild Turkey Federation. So when I called and showed them this data, they're like, uh, oh wow, where do you want a booth? Mm -hmm. uh, would you like your booth up front or in the back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Mule Deer Foundation, Pheasant Fest, um, National Wild Turkey, DSC, SCI. Um, if you call every one of them and ask them who gives the most money to their organization throughout the whole year, we're pretty much number one. Because it's a 100% donation. No one else does a 100% donation, really. You know, like Yeti Cooler might donate a cooler, but then they want half the money back, which covers mm -hmm. their costs, whereas we yeah. don't do that. We just speak. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, silencers are a good giveaway, and I'm pretty sure I know someone who's won. Here was my theory. My theory was that no one knew silencers were legal. No one knew you could hunt with silencers. So if I could have a share of voice at every local chapter in America with all these conservation groups, I win. But mm -hmm. also, I feel like it's unique to my business because we're the manufacturer. We have the product. But we're mm -hmm. also the dealer, so we can deliver it to your front door. No yeah. one else can do that. So I yeah. like stuff that only I can do. Yeah. So this is sort of our like history board. We did a... Um, we did an open house a couple years ago and our marketing team put this together. I don't know where they got all the pictures from, but so this is our U.S. Senator. At the time, he was our governor. Um, when I first started in the business, I was South Dakota silencer. And then I opened a store in North Dakota and I had North Dakota silencer and South Dakota silencer. My goal was to have like every state, like Iowa silencer and the rest. It just gets too confusing, too many websites, too many brochures, too many business cards. So my third location was in Dakota County, Nebraska. So I called it Dakota Silencer. So it was Dakota Silencer for a while. But then the trademark office at the at the feds told me you can't trademark the word Dakota because Dakota Arms had trademarked everything firearms related. And so I couldn't do it. So that's what I came up. I was able to get the domain name Silencer Central. Um, so this right here is our finance area. So up there with sales and like business development, finance and IT. I'll show you guys. <laughs> it's the big office. Yeah, so this is my office. So we have a customer that's like kind of a famous artist. Great stuff. I mean, he can oh, sell this is his work. Yes. Let me take a look. Yeah, at he's that. pretty famous in South Dakota for like paintings. He sells them to like DSC, SCI. That's really cool. Yeah, love it. Get on to it. So this lady has like a special lift that I guess goes all the way up here. If you're wondering how people actually access all of these, this is the machine. Yeah, I would love to see it go up and down, yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is awesome. I need one of these things. I have no actual purpose for it, but I will use it. Sweet, thank you. You're welcome. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> so something else that I like and I'm really into, and you guys know I have a channel, Stranger Palooza, about bands. I notice you guys have a lot of Ram Promaster bands here. Yes. I see one just out the door. Yes. What, what's that for? So, you know, it's evolved. When we first started working events, we used to take a wrap truck and then a wrap trailer, but it's just too much to keep up with the keys of locking the trailer, locking the trailer hitch, locking the truck, putting the alarm on the trailer hitch, to, I mean, on the trailer to make sure no one stole anything. So we went all the vans. So we have six vans total, and we use those to drive. It's 
honestly cheaper for me to drive my staff, have them drive to an actual event instead of us shipping it, because if it doesn't show up, we got a real problem. Yeah, there you go. So another really good use for vans. <laughs> We're shipping accessories directly to consumers, but any serialized item has to go to the location where that customer lives. So most of these shipments are going to the location. Okay. Uh, we, we've been overwhelmed with the volumes of it being approved quicker, so we've tried to outsource most of the accessories and anything that we ship to you when you first buy a silencer. Yeah. And we've tried to focus solely on serialized items here because it kind of has to be here, but everything else we're trying to outsource and then look at building a building next door for a bigger warehouse and also scale up our processes and then try to bring everything back in. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, what's, sure the, you are. what's the biggest caliber you guys make? For? 50. Yo, you have a 50? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Is, it bad? is that a bad Uh No, it's... Probably the biggest one we sell is either AWC or Barrett makes one for their M107. Okay. Oh, but ban so the Banish line, there is no 50 Just yet. Just the 338. Oh, okay. So this is our gunsmithing room. So um, this is where we do all the barrel threading. We also store barrel, we store right over here after we thread them. <coughs> cool. So this, this room is completely sealed off to the rest of the building. Um, the reason why is that cutting fluid that's used on the barrel threading can like permeate all the sheetrock. So it's got its own HVAC, it's got its own generator and everything. So, right. so this is where the barrels come in to be threaded. So the consumer can mail them directly to us. We have a good process called like a 360 where we mail them an empty gun case. We put a FedEx ground, a FedEx ground label comes back to us. We thread it, ship it right back to them. Um, and then also any warranty repairs would come here too for these guys to manage. So the 360, you said you send them a gun case with a label and they ship it back? Yep, yep. We just yeah. say take everything off, scope, bipod. Yeah, I heard that after I broke mine, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So the benefit of sending it to us to thread is it's a CNC lathe and your local gun shop's not gonna have that. There's, there, actually, there's not many manufacturers that have a CNC lathe. So right now I'm just touching off the face of the, the crown. So then the program has a zero, it runs from. And then, sorry, I'm gonna do it shortly. Doesn't work bad, you did. <laughs> um, so now we got that zero, I'm gonna back it out and then make sure everything's ready to roll. So here's another piece of information that I, I failed to share, but it's important. Before we brought threading in-house, and it could just be timing, but 99% of all warranty claims we found were barrel thread, bad barrel thread. So typically people had guns that were threaded that weren't threaded properly, and it put it at a wrong angle, and then you had a baffle strike, and then you were sending it back to us. And then, or it was touching enough in the inside and you didn't realize it, because you look in there and you don't see it, but it was changing the projection of the bullet enough. So really, 99% of all the warranty claims we had, you check alignment on the barrel, and it was wrong. So I think it's fixed it, but also probably people have gotten better, and people have been trained better on barrel threading, but honestly, that was the number one reason. Now we have very few warranty claims, um, and it was mostly because just barrel was threaded properly. It wasn't zeroed correctly. Also, our administrative folks are up here too, they kind of help. If paperwork, something falls through or doesn't work right. But again, this whole space from here, all the way to that, uh, There's that van. So more space. So if you see the um, if you see the generators over there, it's because we did so many biologicals and pharmaceuticals here before that they've got two backups. So this place will run for like two weeks, huh? It's like 600 gallons of diesel in both of those. We don't need it, but it was already here, so. Yeah. <coughs> It's good for the apocalypse, man. You have your own gen. <laughs> so we own a lot next door. And our goal is to put up a, a warehouse over there. Probably this year, the goal is maybe to start it, like do a tilt-up contract. So right now, we're probably walking through when, if you call Silencer Central and talk to someone, these are the dudes you're talking to here, which that's cool, right? So there they are back there. And, oh, there's drapes. 
and snacks. Alright, so we're walking in here to shoot. And here's those vans out in the wild. Awesome. Brandon. Yes, sir. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to actually talk one-on-one -on -one with you here. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So you guys will see here in this video, um, Brandon and the team invited us in. We've, what do we get? Like a, we got a tour yeah. of the factory. Uh, we're about to go to the range and do some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Should do manufacturing, pretty much every department. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So what I would like to do, I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. I will uh, hit you with those questions and see, you know, what kind of answers we get out of you here. <laughs> Let me, um, I think we kind of went over your origin story, right? Yeah. And how you started doing this. I think the big question I would like to ask you with the startup, I think you guys have been around, what, almost 20 years at yeah. this point? Yeah, 2005. So 2005. 2025 will be 20 years, yep. Okay, so what was the point in doing this where, because you're starting this from scratch, you came yeah. from a completely different field, you're totally. a pharmacist. Yeah, totally. Uh, it seems like you're from a family of pharmacists, your wife, yeah. in-laws. Yeah. What was the point in this that you first saw or felt that this was going to be successful? Because it couldn't have been easy to jump from the pharmacy world into the firearms industry and then specifically doing silencers. Yeah. You know, this may sound hard to believe, but I could tell the first gun show I worked, there was just so much interest. I mean, literally think of a gun show with, you know, four or 500 tables and my booth's the busiest and I have like this much space with two used silencers. Um, there's just so much intrigue and interest, you know, how do you buy it? How does it work? Who do you have to tell? Do you have to be fingerprinted? Who else can use it? What happens if I die? Can you hunt with it? You know, like, which gun would I use for what? There's just like so many questions, so much interest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could, the, the hard part is it, it always, at least in my world, was seasonal. So I would always get nervous in the summer because it felt like there was like nothing going on. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> there's no interest anymore. And then it would pick right back up right. in the fall. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the good thing about doing it is I kept my day job. So I just, you know, I would work gun shows and sportsman shows, farm shows in the winter. Typically around here, it altered with the crops. So if the farmers are in the fields, then they're not going to shows. So right. it was basically in the winter months is when they had the shows, which was fine. So mm -hmm. basically every weekend I was working shows. But, um, you know, it worked out well to keep the day job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I ended up getting terminated because they didn't like me doing silencers. So then that made me not necessarily at that point dedicate 100% of my effort, but it made me realize that I was headed in that direction. Okay, I, I had so it was a kick in the pants you really needed yeah, to... totally. Because you kind of had to make a choice one or the other. Yeah. So the comp so you're in the pharmacy world. I don't. We don't necessarily need to name sure. who it was or yeah. anything like yeah. that. But so they, they found out what you were doing and they were like, yeah, these two things don't go together. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was working for a pharmaceutical company and I called my lawyer and I was like, I think they're going to fire me for doing this on the side. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's a French company based in New Jersey. They've already fired you. They just haven't told you yet. And he, was right. Right. he was right. <laughs> yeah. So it's probably very easy for anyone out there to figure yeah. that one out. Yeah. you got all the clues you need yeah, right now. Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So really was, okay, so obviously you knew there was the interest, but, you know, having started this business and putting money into it and all the time, energy, resources that goes into it, when did you really feel like you were seeing that? you know, ROI, the return on the investment coming in? How long did, did that take? That's that's a good question. I mean, um, you know, it was a little different years ago because a lot of people uh, didn't necessarily use credit cards and, you know, sometimes they got blurry, right? You know, if someone paid you cash, then you might go buy a trailer with that cash or, you know, whatever the stuff you needed for the business to run it. So, you know, you weren't doing a great job like we are now where you can tell exactly where every dollar goes and what right. happens to it. Um, I think that, Honestly, it, it completely started out as 
I have a good income because I'm very successful in pharmaceuticals, um, pharmaceutical sales and marketing. And mm -hmm. like, if I could do a hobby and then have it as a business, I could write that off as a, as a loss. Mm -hmm. So honestly, the goal for the first few years is I'm okay with losing money. Let's buy as many toys as Brandon wants, you know, right. guns for display right. at the shows, <laughs> buy silencers for Brandon. Right. I mean, of course you got to get the wife's buy in, but at some point if you're losing money, you're not upset because you're buying toys you like anyway. So that, it, that's kind of how it started because then you could write off like, you know, you sit down with someone and they're like, hey, I, I assume this is still the case. You could write off part of your house as like a, um, yeah. an office space that you're working from. You know, you got your internet, your cell phone. And so it was kind of like, um, gosh, you know, I may not make enough money, but I can reduce my taxes enough that maybe it offsets where I'm just floating even. Yeah. And, I, and that was honestly the goal in the beginning was just how can I not make it cost money, but help me maybe get stuff that I wouldn't get before. And it kind of just breaks even. Yeah. So I did that for a while, um, really for, for quite a while. And, um, but the problem is, as you can imagine, as the business grew, the expenses got bigger. Yeah. And then there was years where you had to overinvest, like either hire up people or, or buy inventory so far in advance that you could feel it like feeling a negative. I mean, one negative I remember is, um, local police department called and said, Hey, we want to get silencers so that we can shoot deer here in town. And I was like, Oh, that's great. I'd love that. It'd be great service for me to offer. And they said, Hey, we got a federal grant and we're excited to work with you and local company. And so I gave them $50,000 for the silencers. That grant didn't come in for like nine months. Wow. So I'm yeah. floating that the whole time. That's a tough part owning your own business. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I just, I, I didn't even think about that. I just thought, right. Oh, a federal grant. That'd be great. Oh yeah. yeah. Glad to help you. <laughs> I'll sell them to you at cost. I don't want you guys to, you know, I want you to like me, you know, it's not going to mm -hmm. cost me anything to get these in inventory and sell them to you at my cost. This will be fine. And yeah, before I know it, I'm like, man, what was I thinking? When is that money coming? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Totally. I can relate to it because Lola is a pharmacist. Yeah. And through the, at this point, maybe 11 or 12 years I've been doing this, she's pretty much been funding what I'm doing yeah. and waiting for like, when's that success point? You know, if anyone cares to know with us, it's probably been in the last year Good. and not really necessarily from the firearms side of what I do on YouTube, okay. maybe from somewhere else, okay. but we, you know, we're FFLs yeah. and SOTs yeah. and, you know, um, yeah, I think, it's, it's a lot of what you said, right? Like I'm doing it so that I can do what I'm doing on YouTube, but also I'm really into to guns and it's yeah. nice to have, you know, this gun, that gun, but you have to at some point rationalize it. The wife is always the boss. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah, so I can completely relate totally. to like pharmacy money went into what I'm doing as yeah, well. Totally. So it's, it's nice to see that yeah. with you too. And to know that it's, it's successful. Yeah. Um, what's the most important thing you want the people out there watching this to take away about Silencer Central? You know, I would say that um, our goal is to be extremely professional and make sure that we do things 100% above board. Um, I know that the lot of, there's a lot of firearms companies out there that sort of have a, you know, ban the ATF and almost more of an anti-government approach, which I don't necessarily disagree with. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that to have the best experience for me and my customers, it's to have a working relationship with the ATF. Right. So we've taken more of a proactive approach of sitting down with them and saying, hey, here's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Here's how it would benefit you, ATF. Here's how it'd benefit us. Here's how yeah. it'd benefit the consumer. Where, where do we find a happy ground here where everybody can get along and make it work? Yeah. Because what I found is it's not, it's, I mean, you can see the amount of expenses we put into this place and a number of employees. And I sometimes look out in the parking lot, you know, you got 160, 175 cars out there. Um, I can't do stuff that would put us in the crosshairs of the government or my employees or my customers. It just, it's a different approach. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've, and I, and it probably hurts us to be honest in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, I feel like a lot of the people that were selling silencers um, before we became as, you know, we're 2005, so we're mm -hmm. one of the first ones that was like actively selling them, more so as a dealer. Yeah. Um, but I know there was manufacturers that came out really strong, you know, anti-government, shut down the ATF, yeah. uh, like sort of an adversarial. And I do think that the audience we sell to responds to that. I mean, I, I mean, from I think that's true. And the way yeah. I vote, I vote that way. But yeah. I'm just saying, I, you know, I had a friend tell me the other day, and this is totally true, that whether we like it or not, the ATF has a monopoly on interpreting mm. the rules. So yeah. if, if I want to protect my customers, my employees, and myself, and my investment, I got to make sure I'm working with them, in my yeah. mind. Yeah. So we've created a different approach where, uh, I'm not saying we ask for permission for everything, but if we feel like it's a gray area, we sit down with them and say, hey, how do we, how do we know what to do here? The laws are clear or you haven't given us direction or you know, we want to make sure we're doing things right because it just yeah. doesn't make sense to scale up a business or put people at risk doing things that would conflict with what the ATF wants us to do. So yeah. it's not a bowing down to, it's uh, you know, a professional 
discussion and we've had tough discussions with them and we fought them on stuff. So it's not a, it's not a roll over and do what they say. It's just, it's a different approach. I, I, I see where you're coming from because I know when I was looking into you, I looked at some things and I, saw, I was like, if this guy is able to do this, because what you're doing at Silence of Central is not normal. No. Right? Not from the past. It, you know, and you found a way to get through and make this happen and you're able to do it in 42 states that people can go online and go through all the paperwork and your guys communicate. I went through the whole process, right? Yeah. Your guys communicate and walk people through things. And so eventually at the end of this process, you're suppressors your silencers come to you in the mail um it, it's that's revolutionary if you really look at it it's never happened before true six for example like the second amendment's really important right we yeah. don't get to have these things and people in other countries definitely don't have it but we don't get to have it if we let the second amendment get eroded right. it's really important to the whole idea of freedom in america for me so i ask companies do you guys care about that and they tell me no we don't care about politics and that kind of rubs you the wrong way because you're like, hey, you have to care about this. You have to be aware of it. So, how you know, since this, you you know, you mentioned that, my question to you is, how do you look at the politics side of this? You've got to work with the ATF, but there's someone that's in charge of them that changes based on politics. So, what's the equation in your mind for dealing with that? Yeah. So. You know, politics is super important to us because I'm licensed in 42 states. So I have to watch each state because they could change the state law and make them illegal in their state or make the process so difficult it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So I have to watch state law. So I'm watching politics all the time at a state level, but also a federal level. Because what I find with the ATF is um, their boss is basically the attorney general of the United States. Mm -hmm. And if that's a Republican, it's a different direction than if it's a Democrat. Exactly. Um, I mean, it's just... I, I sense that the agency feels empowered when there's a Democrat in office and they're typically a little bit harder on us or they don't communicate as much. They're not as forthright. Mm -hmm. But then I find the same is true that when it switches over to a Republican, they become more open. They become more willing to work with us. So politics is a big deal for us. Um, I am so like obsessed with keeping up with politics that I petition and I was able to like convince the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation to allow me on their board and it's the largest bipartisan group in all of Congress. And they figure that both sides look at um, sportsmen, you know, and conservation, Democrat and Republican both find that important. So I like sitting on that board because I can go to the meetings and sort of get to know both sides and understand what the issues are. But one thing I found getting to know the ATF is they'll usually hint to what the issues are. Um, and then when a Democrat gets in office, they start creating executive orders. They start trying to take this stuff down. So I'm always communicating with them to try to see if there's anything in my world that's going to be on the radar screen. I mean, even the example of the pistol braces, my concern was, well, if they require all these people to get these pistol braces and let's say 5 million people decide to register them, then that's going to put my people further in yeah. line waiting to get a silencer. So I have to stay 100% in tune with this all the time. Yeah, and that could be part of the strategy, right? Totally, yeah. With bottlenecks in. Oh. We see that happening in the industry. I don't know if you've suffered from that. Obviously, you know, when you were in your, in your previous job, you did suffer. But there, there's, there's um, different banks and things like that not allowing commerce yes. if it's firearms yes. guys or looking into the credit cards and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. We've been discriminated against by... Um, yeah credit card companies and banks. You've done business in the normal or regular business world, right? What kind of differences or challenges do you see running a firearms related business? Do you think it's more difficult than doing business in the regular world, the same? You know, I think it's harder because there's a lot of, I hate to use the word uneducated people, but there's people that don't know anything about firearms. And I always say that to get a federal firearms license, step one, honestly, is to call the local zoning where you want to put it. And almost 100% of every zoning office in America, if you call them and say, I want to put a federal firearms license in your area, you get a big, uh, we're not interested in that. Yeah. It's just, it's just, an, it's perceived as a negative. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I've always said it's easier to open um, a shop selling marijuana in Las Vegas than it is a farm shop, which mm -hmm. to me doesn't make sense being a pharmacist, but um, I agree. I do think that firearms is hard because people have perceptions that are hard to overcome and then they use those biased against you. Um, 
it's super hard. I can't advertise anything on social media or anything that's digital because most of the companies that created those platforms are in states where silencers are illegal and they don't think the same way we do. So mm -hmm. I can't use PayPal. I can't use eBay. I can't use Amazon. I can't use Google. Yeah. I can't use Facebook. I yeah. can't use Instagram, TikTok. None of those will allow me. So I'm kind of handcuffed. It's right. almost like they see what we do as sinful, so they don't want to make it easy for us yeah. to do business. How do we overcome that? We're literally talking about something that's covered by the Constitution. Yeah, I, you yeah. know, I, it's tough. I just, I wish more attorney generals in states would say, hey, if you don't allow lawful businesses in my state to do commerce on your platform, then we're not going to let you do business here. I, I mean, agree. That, that would be a difficult stretch because there's probably more people that want to use Facebook or eBay than people selling firearms in South mm -hmm. Dakota. But um, somebody has to stand up to the bully and sort of, you know, probably people that aren't in the farm space don't even realize that that's an obstacle we have to deal with. Yeah. I think we have to stand up and push back, even if it comes to suing. We may not win, right? but just the actual pushback may, may make them realize like, oh, maybe we don't, we don't want to really mess with these guys. Especially if we, it may sound like a bad word, organize. Yeah, totally. And realize that it's affecting everyone. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so my last question, because I know you have to run, what's the next innovation from Silencer Central that we can look forward to? I know maybe you don't want to break some news here, but what kind of, you know, because yeah. you're, you're innovative in terms of your process, but what's the next thing? Yeah, so I know we're looking at a silencer for hunting that works more on recoil. Mm -hmm. So we know that a silencer has the same amount of recoil reduction as a muzzle brake, but the, the feedback we're getting is, well, could you create one that takes it to the next level where you have even more recoil reduction and still is a silencer. Oh. So we got something in the pipeline that I think is going to be exciting. We're going to partner with a, with a, a large company that kind of has a good sort of audience in that market and kind of come together and launch it together. So I'd see that coming this fall. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brandon. Thanks. I really Thank appreciate you, you and everyone else here, the whole team, welcoming that. us. We're walking around here and yeah. showing everyone at work. I don't know if everyone was ready necessarily to be <laughs> on right. camera, but it's been awesome to see this. And, and uh, if folks out there have questions and stuff like that, I'll point them to you guys. To, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the exposure. You're welcome. Yes, sir. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this detailed look inside Silencer Central in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We're out of here. We're going out on the MP5. Right. And I'm going to go all the way up to this one.